Hello and welcome to API Security with a Pinch of Salt. My name is Chris Westfall and I'm joined today by Ron Barth, one of our principal security engineers. Uh, welcome, Ron, how are you doing? Doing well, thanks. Thanks awesome. for having me, Chris. Yeah, thanks for coming back. You keep coming back, I appreciate it. Um, this time around we're gonna talk about what attackers can do with API vulnerabilities. I, I think you know this is a question we get a lot. Um, People obviously understand other types of vulnerabilities in infrastructure and in applications. Uh, but when it comes to APIs, a lot of times people are trying to wrap their head around the types of vulnerabilities. And then they always ask, you know, what, what are the implications? What, what can an attacker actually do? So we're going to get into that. Um, but I want to start off by talking about what aren't people thinking about when it comes to API vulnerabilities. You know, they are different. We always say they are different than traditional um, web application vulnerabilities, but how are they different? And, and what's different about them and, and, and why might people not be fully uh, understanding the implications and the, and the risk of, of APIs and the vulnerabilities? Yeah, definitely, so um, I think one of the, the most important things to, to remember about API traffic is that it is different than what you would uh, consider regular web traffic. Yeah. Uh, APIs are unique, right? So uh, company A, I would have completely different APIs than company B in most cases. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and when they are unique, they, they do not conform to any pattern or um, um, uh, signature uh, that that uh, uh, that could help protect uh, that type of, of unique uh, uh, traffic. Um, and when attackers are, are probing someone's APIs, they will go through a reconnaissance phase and they would try to find uh, unique vulnerabilities in uh, in the API logic, mm -hmm. uh, which would then uh, lead to things like uh, you know, data exfiltration, account takeover, and just uh, generally other bad stuff. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get into some of those uh, in a bit here, but you, you mentioned API logic, and that's something that we talk about a lot, but um, I'm not sure if everyone understands what we mean when we say API logic. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you know what that means in the context of an API? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so API logic basically, like, you know, when, when a developer uh, is, is writing the code for a new API, mm -hmm. uh, that code would have a certain logic to it that would make sure or, or ensure that the functionality uh, requested in that API is, is achieved. Uh, yeah. It could be something like, uh, you know, as simple as a, as a database uh, query to retrieve uh, a record. Um, attackers could try and find flaws in that logic and then manipulate them to get the API to perform functions uh, that it was not intended for. Yeah, so we, I mean, we always uh, talk about API attacks as being low and slow and that, that's that process, reconnaissance as you mentioned is that process of understanding that logic and then looking for those parameters or those, those areas in the logic that can be manipulated to get the API to do what the developers never thought it should do or never intended, never really thought about those corner cases. Um, that's what, what attackers are really good at. Um, yeah. What, what are some common API vulnerabilities? You know, if you were to, uh, I guess, throw out, throw out some terms, what are some things that you would talk about if somebody asks, asks about that? Yeah, so um, uh, OWASP uh, did a, a great job in, in, uh, in mapping some of the top API vulnerabilities. They, they released uh, the OWASP top 10 for API security mm -hmm. uh, at the end of last year. And, uh, and on that list, you can find so, uh, things such as uh, BOLA, which is uh, broken object level authorization. Mm -hmm. That's number one on the list. Uh, what happens with BOLA is an attacker would uh, authenticate using a certain user ID or a certain set of credentials. Uh, and then they would manipulate the um, API requests and use a different user ID uh, in a, a query parameter or something like that, the application will identify the user as an authenticated user because uh, it, it would still have the authenticated user uh, user ID in uh, maybe in the cookie or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, when the attacker is using a different user ID in a different place in the request, uh, it could trick the server into sending them data for that other user. I see. Uh, so that's one, one example of, of an API vulnerability. Um, and maybe uh, another example is uh, what's called mass assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, A6 on the OWASP top 10. Uh, and mass assignment is, uh, is when uh, um, an attacker uh, 
would add additional fields or parameters when they send uh, the, the API requests that are not expected by the server. Mm -hmm. uh, so the server will receive the, those um, additional fields, and if it, if it doesn't know how to handle them properly, or if it doesn't know that it only needs to accept a certain list of, of parameters, it might uh, take those parameters and use them for uh, you know, nefarious uh, uh, purposes. So it could be you know, a, a, um, an attacker that's trying to gain admin access to an API. So by just adding a field called is admin mm -hmm. equals true, uh, they, could, they could possibly do that. Makes sense. So, you know, like you, you mentioned OWASP, and I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with OWASP. Um, and we always like to make sure that it's clear that um, when we talk about OWASP, the project that we're referring to is the OWASP API Security Top 10, which uh, I think is dated 2019. It came out uh, right at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. A lot of people are familiar with the uh, Web App Security Top 10. I think the latest version is from 2017. And if you look at the two, um, the, the, as, you, as you mentioned, the, the, the vulnerabilities and the, the risks that are outlined in both those projects are, are, are somewhat different. I think there's a, very, there's, a, there's a few vulnerabilities that have carried over from the Web App Security Top 10. Obviously, that's you know, still very relevant. But in the world of, of uh, API applications and um, and the sorts of things, uh, these vulnerabilities are very specific to that, um, uh, to those types of apps in those environments. Um, so you, you, yeah, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, the, the new list is about uh, 70% new items Yeah. Uh, because, because how, how different, uh, you know, API vulnerabilities are than the, the normal or, or, uh, re regular, uh, web application vulnerabilities. Makes sense. So um, you know, we're, what I want to do is now talk ab about maybe some of the results of those vulnerabilities. So once a, an attacker has um, you know, done the reconnaissance, they, they understand uh, the logic, they, they, you know, they've started kind of poking and prodding and, and tweaking that logic, trying to do things. What are, what are some things that they may want to, what are some of the results uh, that they might want to get from, you know, from those vulnerabilities? You, you, you talked about BOLA and you kind of alluded to uh, a result there, but maybe you can dig in a little bit uh, more. Yeah, definitely. So, so when a, when an attacker is uh, is attempting Ebola, uh, what they can gain from that is, uh, you know, obviously access to to another user's information. Yeah. Uh, if if uh, if the attacker was able to trick the server into uh, thinking that uh, they are authenticated, but uh, they're requesting data for another another user ID, uh, then that obviously get, gives them access to data that they, they should not have access to. Yeah. Uh, but uh, potentially, de depending on how severe the Ebola is, um, an attacker could, could do a complete account takeover and uh, not only get data, but also take actions as the uh, other user. That's, yeah, so account takeover is a big one. I, I, I always think of um, USPS, a vulnerability disclosure that was done, I think it was back in 2019, where you know, that, I thought that was a good example of, a, of Ebola, where you could uh, ba basically just uh, tweak the, the account parameters and, and get uh, details from another, another user. Um, yeah. I, I guess, you know, that, that it, it doesn't quite lead to data exfiltration. Uh, well, I guess it could on an on a account by account, but... Um, you know, I always think of data exfiltration as being uh, in mass or, or at scale. I mean, how, how would you perform exfiltration at scale with uh, API vulnerability? Um, yeah, many, many of the items on the uh, API security top 10 can lead to data exfiltration. Um, but I think a good example could be uh, when... Um, when you have uh, an attacker remove a field. I've, I've mentioned mass assignment, uh, mm -hmm. which is where an attacker would add a field. But attackers can try to also manipulate the APIs by, by removing fields. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a good example we've seen before is, uh, you know, if you have an API endpoint that, um, that requires the user ID field in order to pull uh, records for a specific user, mm -hmm. um, if the backend implementation of that uh, API endpoint um, is is not uh, very well defined. Uh, when an attacker removes that user ID field, uh, the server uh, may may think, uh, well, I don't have a user ID. Well, I guess I just don't need to filter anything and return the data for all users. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, a very a very common example of of uh, mass data exfiltration. And I, I think that's you know back to um, 
one of the original things we talked about early on in the session, uh, logic, right? The API logic, it's very complex. And as a developer, you may make some assumptions about the way the logic should work or the way that the application or the service is interacting with that logic. But here's an example of how, um, you know, an attacker is going to look for ways to, to tweak that logic or kind of um, uh, uh, apply that logic in a different manner, right? You, you're removing, instead of providing an input for that, that is used as a filter, you're removing that input and the, and the logic basically says, I don't, I don't have anything to filter with, so I'm just going to return the whole database in this case. And I think this becomes especially difficult as you're, you know, as you're uh, layering APIs, putting APIs together uh, that have come from, you know, different developers, different groups, different partners. Uh, a lot of the assumptions of the, you know, the, the original assumptions of the logic start to break down, right? You can't make, you can't make those assumptions. You have to start thinking about more and more of those potential corner cases like this. And it becomes very difficult to do. Uh, it, it's difficult as a developer, and it's also difficult to, you know, I think to create policy to look for these uh, these types of vulnerabilities or to protect against these types of vulnerabilities. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing we we often hear about, and you know, this is classic, is the um, um, well, I think a lot of people when they think about denial of service, they think about distributed denial of service (DDoS). Uh, but just as impactful, I think, is you know, the, the single D, the the denial of service. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between a DDoS and a DOS and, you know, how impactful a DOS attack could be in the context of an API and, and just how hard those are to detect? Yeah, definitely. So um, uh, denial of service is, uh, th there are many different types of denial of service attacks. Uh, the, the purpose of all of them is usually to exhaust the resources of the backend servers and make sure that they cannot uh, respond to legitimate user uh, requests. Yeah. Um, uh, a DDoS attack is a distributed denial of service, and, and normally, uh, what that attack uh, is, is is built of is basically a very big number of clients sending many many requests uh, to at the same time in order to overwhelm an application with with high volume. Yeah. Uh, and this is how they would overwhelm the, the backend server and 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 use all of the resources. Uh, and and there are you know this is. This is something that uh, there are many services out there to help prevent that. Um, the difference between that and a, uh, just a, a single D denial of service is uh, is that a single D or you know not a distributed denial of service is is an attack where uh, again uh, it's trying to manipulate the logic of the APIs uh, to to make the application uh, work very hard. Uh, and, and, and by doing that, exhaust the resources and uh, crash the application. And, and th those types of attacks are very hard to identify and block because uh, you know there's no sign of increased traffic or anything like that. You know, once the uh, attacker uh, completed their reconnaissance, they could potentially do a, a DOS attack with a single request. Yeah. Uh, and an example for that could be. You know, if you have an API that re returns a list of, of items uh, and uh, it would return, uh, you know, 10 items per page and th mm -hmm. there's a per page uh, parameter. If, uh, if an attacker is trying to crash the service, they might try to manipulate the, vo the, the value of that parameter. So instead of sending per page equals 10, uh, they could send per page equals 10 million. Yeah. Uh, and, and with a single request, if if the if the application is not protected with a single request, make the the application return the entire database and basically you know, crash the application. Yeah, so just as impactful, but from an attacker standpoint, it, it takes you know arguably less coordination. I mean, you uh, I don't want to simplify this and say you just need to understand the logic, but the fact that you can do uh, something just as impactful. Uh, under the radar with a DOS attack by just figuring out, you know, if, if I can uh, increase a, a parameter like you mentioned versus having to go through the coordination of a distributed denial of service and the, and the costs associated with that. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it's huge. I, I always think, you know, um, attackers oftentimes look for the path of least resistance. And this is another good example of getting, uh, you know, a very impactful result with, without having to go through uh, maybe all the risk and effort of, of having to coordinate a distributed denial of service attack. So. Yeah, and, and just thinking about trying to protect against something like that, you know, it's, it's very hard uh, for, for traditional solutions to, to protect against something like that because, 
every, like we said, every API is unique. Every API has its own logic and, and that uh, potential vulnerability could appear in completely different places for different APIs. Uh, yeah. It will not come from, from you know, distributed, multiple distributed uh, clients. It could come from a single client with a single request and uh, the request could, uh, could seem harmless. Yeah. Uh, so again, very hard to, to protect against, yeah. Well, the other thing uh, I wanna mention that we didn't mention during this conversation is that oftentimes these are authenticated users that have access to, um, to poke around and, and understand the logic, right? That it doesn't, uh, right. the barrier to entry, I guess, or the, the access to the API, that exposure of logic is, is done naturally by the API. So, you know, you don't have those protections where, um, you know, they, they don't have access. They can't, they can't start to poke around. So I guess that, that is a risk. I mean, you're, you're kind of, the nature of APIs is that you're exposing, uh, you have to expose that logic and it, it kind of opens things up for attackers right. to go poke around. Yeah. Um, well, awesome. They, yeah, I think, you know, there's some uh, great things to think about. I mean, we, I, I know Ron, you work with a lot of customers and, and get a lot of these questions and you've seen a lot of these, uh, these types of vulnerabilities. I mean, the other the other concerning thing is that, as you mentioned, a lot of these types of attacks, because they're very subtle. Um, you know, back to your point, I can with the, with a single API call, I can perform a DOS attack because they're very subtle. They're very difficult um, to detect with traditional solutions. Also, because, like you said, all these APIs are unique. If I create an API and you create an API, the logic is going to be different. Uh, so you can't you can't expect or you can't look for commonalities and vulnerabilities, um, you know, that at, at a level where you can enforce and you can look, you yeah. can categorize them as they have done with the, the OS top 10. But um, yeah, beyond that, it becomes very, very difficult. Um, but, you know, the, the result is, uh, is just as impactful. Um, well, Ron, I want to thank you again for, for joining us and providing some insights into the, the types of vulnerabilities and the, the impact of those vulnerabilities and look forward to having you on again in the future. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you soon. And, you know, as you're watching this, if you have comments, uh, you want to add your perspective or if, if there are things you'd love to see us cover on future episodes, please add them in the, in the comments wherever you're, wherever you're watching this. And thanks for watching.